So now we can further move on. So I invite here now Professor Kosik Chattopadhyay. Professor Chattopadhyay is an Indian structure biologist, protein biologist, and professor at the Department of Biological Sciences, uh, I Sir Mohali. And uh, he has completed his postdoctorate from the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, New York. And recently he has been honored by C.R. Krishna Murthy Award Society of Biological Chemistry India for contribution in the field of biochemistry and allied sciences. So I invite him to deliver the talk on bacterial pore forming toxins and structural basis of membrane damaging virulence mechanism. Yeah, Dr. Chetopadhyay. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for the kind introduction. Uh, am I audible enough in the back? Okay, thank you. And also many thanks for this invitation to present our work here today. I will take you all to a different kind of journey, what uh, you have been listening so far. Uh, so what I will do, I will try to give you an overview of our research interest in the lab that we have been doing for last 12, 13 years or so at Aysar Mohali, which is just a uh, neighboring institute, maybe one or two kilometers from here. So what we do? We study a very unique class of protein toxins that are commonly designated as pore-forming toxins. Yeah. So these pore-forming toxins, why they are so unique? Because they damage target cell membranes and they do so by punching holes in the plasma membrane. And that is why they are called pore-forming toxins. Now, very interestingly, many pathogenic bacteria employ these pore-forming toxins as their potent virulence factors. In fact, more than one-third of known bacterial protein toxins, they belong uh, to this pore-forming toxin family. So, Let's look at how they function in general. So pathogenic bacteria secrete these pore-forming toxins as water-soluble monomeric molecules. And when they bind their target eukaryotic cell membranes, they form membrane-embedded oligomeric pores. And the consequence is very simple. The permeability barrier function of the target plasma membrane gets destroyed and which can eventually lead to cell death. Now this is an overall general mechanism shared by most of the PFT family members. But in spite of sharing this overall general scheme, individual members of bacterial PFT family, they differ from each other in the intricate details of their mechanism of action. And that is why we have to study each of them individually, and we discover various fascinating aspects of their mechanism of action. A major part of our research remain focused on one very prominent bacterial pore-forming toxin, that is Vibrio cholerae cytolysin, and now onward I will abbreviate it as VCC. So VCC is produced by most of the pathogenic strains of gram-negative bacteria, Vibrio cholerae, and I assume that all of you know that Vibrio cholerae is the causative agent of cholera, which is a severe diarrheal disease. And apart from cholera toxin, which is the major virulence factor of Vibrio cholerae, VCC is also considered as a potent accessory toxin for many of the uh, V. cholerae strains. Now, how it works? So initially, bacteria secretes VCC as a precursor molecule termed as pro-VCC. And upon secretion and by the action of bacterial proteases, this N-terminal prodomain gets removed and the mature active form of the toxin gets liberated. And in one of our very earlier studies, we have shown that presence of this pro-domain provides some sort of structural plasticity in the molecular architecture of the toxin, which might be required for efficient secretion and proper folding of this toxin molecule. Now, in its overall mode of action, VCC acts as a beta-barrel pore-forming toxin. So, as I mentioned, that 
soluble monomeric form of the toxin that is the active form of the toxin, okay? But when it finds its target eukaryotic cell membrane, it binds there and then assemble into a transmembrane beta barrel, okay? And in this whole process, what happens, there is a specific motif that undergoes severe structural reorganization. So the central scaffold of the molecule is, is this so-called cytolysine domain, which harbors this pore-forming motif. And in this soluble monomeric form, this pore-forming motif remains packed against the cytolysine domain as pre-stem motif. And in the course of oligomeric pore formation, this pre-stem motif from all these contributing protomers, they undergo structural rearrangement and then they insert into the membrane and they create this transmembrane beta barrel, which is the final architecture or main functional scaffold through which, you know, membrane gets perforated. Now, apart from this cytolysine domain, VCC also harbors two additional lectin-like domains, which are not commonly documented in structurally related bacterial PFTs, and I will come back to their functionalities a little later. Now, through our own studies, we have elucidated some of the discrete steps of pore formation mechanism employed by VCC. We have shown that monomeric units first bind to the target membrane, and then they assemble into a transient intermediate called pre-pore. And subsequently, the pore-forming motifs from this pre-pore insert into the membrane, and then it creates the functional pore. Now, in a very recent collaborative cryo-EM studies, we now kind of confirm that indeed VCC follows this overall architecture and in the process of functional pore, it forms a pre-pore intermediate. Now, membrane interaction or binding to target membrane components is one of the key events in the process of pore formation by any bacterial PFT including, of course, for that of VCC. And through our studies, we examine some of the in membrane interaction events that are employed by VCC molecule. So in one of our studies, we observed that VCC employs a specific structural motif to recognize and bind to membrane phospholipid molecules. And this structural motif is composed of this membrane proximal three loop sequences in this molecule. Apart from membrane phospholipids, VCC can also recognize cell surface carbohydrates that are attached to uh, cell surface uh, glycoprotein or glycolipid molecules. So I have already mentioned that VCC harbors two lectin-like domains which can potentially interact with carbohydrates. And through our study, we have shown that the lectin-like activity of this beta prism domain, it mediates a specific interaction of the toxin with cell surface carbohydrate molecules. Now, apart from membrane phospholipids and cell surface carbohydrates, membrane cholesterol also plays very important role in the pore formation mechanism of VCC. Through our study, we have shown that VCC can directly bind to membrane cholesterol, and for this, it employs a specific structural motif within its structure, and if we deplete membrane cholesterol, then the pore-forming activity of VCC gets drastically compromised. And consistent with these observations, VCC is shown to get targeted toward cholesterol-rich membrane microdomains on the target biomembranes. So altogether, this clearly suggests that membrane cholesterol is very critical for the pore formation mechanism of VCC. So what we observe so far, that VCC employs multiple interaction mechanisms. It interacts with membrane phospholipids specifically. It can recognize cell surface carbohydrates. It can also recognize membrane cholesterol. So it employs multiple interaction processes. Now, so far I was talking about membrane binding step. Now, another, the most enigmatic aspect of any beta-PFT stru structure function mechanism 
is the structural rearrangement of the spore forming motif because ultimately this structural motif creates this transmembrane beta barrel. Now interestingly, these pore forming motifs, although they share very similar structural disposition, they share very little or almost no sequence similarity. Therefore, it remains unclear how these pore forming motif residues are important or whether they are at all important or not for the pore formation mechanism of the, uh, any beta PFTs. So in this direction, we took our initiative and attempted to explore whether any of these pore forming motif residues in VCC, whether they play any role in the mechanism of action. So for this, what we did, we first targeted these four aromatic amino acid residues within this pore forming motif. Now why these aromatic residues only? Because when we compared the structure of the monomeric state of the molecule and final transmembrane beta barrel state, we find that in the monomeric state, these four amino acid residues, they remain buried against this cytolysine domain. And in the process of oligomeric pore formation, they get protruded outwardly from this beta barrel scaffold. Therefore, we can expect that in the process of oligomeric pore formation, these four residues, they experience a drastic change in their physicochemical environment. And also to add, we know that for proteins which tend to act on the membrane water interface, aromatic residues play a very important role at, in those boundaries. So what we did, we generated mutant variants of VCC in which we systematically replace these aromatic residues with alanine. And when tested for their pore forming activity against biomembranes of erythrocytes or artificial membrane lipid bilayer of liposomes, we find that mutation of this tyrosine 321 residue, that resulted in a drastic loss of pore forming activity. That means this residue is very critical for the pore formation mechanism. Now, interestingly, this mutation did not affect membrane binding propensity, but it blocked oligomerization property of the toxin. So typically, wild type VCC molecule, it forms these heptameric ring-like architectures in the target membrane. But in contrast, this mutant tyrosine 321 to alanine, it fails to form similar kind of ring-like architecture or pore architecture in the target membrane. Rather, it formed mostly incomplete and, as, and abortive assembly states that clearly suggests that somehow this mutant arrests membrane-bound toxin molecule in their abortive intermediate state, and they do not allow functional pore formation to take place. Now, Careful analysis of the structure further showed that this tyrosine residue is located at this hinge region of the pore forming motif. And at this site, this tyrosine residue is surrounded mostly by hydrophobic, amino, hydrophobic residues, not aromatic residues, but other hydrophobic residues are located at this pocket. So by looking at this structural disposition, we thought whether if we muted this tyrosine residue, whether that creates some sort of disruption in the structural constraint in this hinge region. Indeed, MD simulation and network analysis by our collaborator suggested that this mutation of tyrosine 321 to alanine affects optimal communication between distinct domains and structural modules in the molecule, and also it affects mutual dynamics of these domains during oligomeric pore formation mechanism. So altogether, it appears that this tyrosine 321 residue possibly maintains an optimal structural constraint at this hinge region, which is otherwise extremely crucial to sense membrane interaction so that it can further trigger this structural rearrangement of the pore forming motif. In fact, a very similar structural disposition of this tyrosine residue 
or a conserved tyrosine residue within a hydrophobic pocket is also noticed in the structurally related bacterial beta PFTs, such as leukosidin F and Staphylococcus aureus alpha hemolysin. So that means that the mechanism that we are proposing here, it is not only limited to VCC, but it may also be operational in the case of structurally related beta pore forming toxins. Uh, I hope I'm doing fine with the timing. Okay, now in the same direction, we further explored whether any other residues within the pore forming motif, whether they can impart any kind of regulatory role. In fact, we found in a very recent study that there is another charged residue. Now, please note, this is not any aromatic or hydrophobic residue anymore. There is another charged residue that is positioned at 289, which is a glutamate residue. It also plays a distinct regulatory role. So our biochemical, biophysical, and structural studies showed that mutation of this glutamate at position 289 to alanine, it arrests membrane-bound toxin molecule in a pre-pore state. So all our data suggested that because of this muta mutation, majority of the toxin molecule get arrested in this pre-pore state where functional beta barrel is not created. But, but very interestingly, if we increase the temperature condition within, of course, physiological range of temperature condition, then this pre-pore state can be converted more efficiently to the functional pore state. That means because of this mutation, the energy barrier, energy barrier associated with the pore formation mechanism, that gets elevated. And it requires higher temperature condition to overcome this energy barrier for the functional pore formation mechanism. So unlike that previous mutation I was mentioning, that tyrosine residue at 321, this residue, glutamate at position 289, it is imparting a different regulatory role. It is allowing pre-pore oligomer to form, but unable to convert into functional pore. So altogether, it seems that pore forming motif residues, they can play various different regulatory roles in the pore formation mechanism. So the current model of beta barrel pore formation by beta PFT suggests that membrane binding triggers oligomerization and formation of pre-pore, and that is associated with partial collapse of the pore forming motifs. And finally, the membrane insertion of these pore forming motifs create the functional pore. So our study shows that specific residues within this pore forming motif, they can regulate the entire process either by regulating the process at this juncture or it can also regulate the process by controlling efficiency at this juncture. Now it remains to be seen whether similar residues, similar kind of conserved residues in the similar structurally related beta PFTs, whether they they impart similar regulatory role. Now, before I finish, I would like to talk about one of our very recent studies uh, in which we discovered a very interesting aspect of membrane pore formation or pathophysiological function. So what we discovered that apart from pore formation dependent membrane disruption, VCC can also trigger programmed cell death in the target nucleated mammalian cells, and that process can also happen even in the absence of pore formation mechanism. So what we did in this study, we employed two pore formation deficient mutants of VCC. One, arginine 330 to alanine mutant, and delta pre-stem mutant. So in this arginine 330 mutant, what happens, this muted, mut mutation results in compromised oligomerization ability of the toxin, so it cannot efficiently form pore. But there is more drastic defect in this delta PS mutant because this mutant lacks the pore forming motif. That means it can no way form transmembrane beta barrel. So consistent with these structural defects, both these mutants showed complete loss of pore forming 
membrane damaging activity. But very interestingly, these mutants still displayed potent cytotoxicity in the target nucleated mammalian cells. And they also triggered several hallmark features of programmed apoptotic cell death that include DNA fragmentation, caspase 3 activation, and membrane phosphatidylserine flipping. And all these features are also triggered by wild-type VCC molecule. That means these apoptotic cell death or signatures of apoptotic cell death are triggered by VCC variants even in the absence of pore formation mechanism. We further observed that wild-type VCC as well as these pore formation deficient mutant, they could trigger mitochondrial damage in terms of increased my mitochondrial membrane permeability. Transition happening, okay? And very interestingly, we observe that both wild type and these mutant variants of VCC, they showed a prominent propensity to get translocated to the mitochondria of the target cell. Now, this is a fascinating observation because VCC or any other beta PFT, they are traditionally known as bacterial exotoxins and their journey is expected to be limited on the plasma membrane. But here we are observing that it is not only working on the plasma membrane, but a significant population can go to the mitochondria. Now our speculation is this mitochondrial migration or VCC might be correlated with its ability to cause mitochondrial damage and that can somehow trigger apoptotic features in the target cells. Now through our ongoing research we are currently pursuing this direction, but at least we are happy that this study was very recently accepted in Facet Journal. So basically through this study, we could decipher a distinct implications of dual pathophysiological function of VCC. On one hand, it can cause membrane damage that can, of course, call, uh, cause cell death. But even if it cannot impart pore formation mechanism, it can still exert uh, apoptotic cell death in the target cells. And we hypothesize that these two functionalities might have distinct implications for the pathophysiological responses uh, that are caused during a V. coli infection in the, in, the, in the host. So with this, I will finish my talk. And before I finish, of course, my sincere thanks and acknowledgement to all my past and present lab members. My uh, sincere thanks to all my collaborators, in particular Shomnath, uh, who, whose lab has been instrumental for all these cryo-EM studies. And my sincere thanks to all the funding agencies and, of course, Aisar Mohali for all support and uh, funding. And finally, thank you all. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chattopadhyay, for giving very molecular insights on the host pathogen interactions, specifically on the pore forming toxins and how it impact on the immunobiological modulations. So my only comment is here, how these pore forming toxins are cross-talking with the immunity markers. Okay. Uh, I did not get chance to talk about that. Uh, of course, there are plenty of reports. And this is kind of an emerging field uh, because, as I was mentioned toward the end, until 2010, because these pore-forming toxins, they were traditionally discovered at hemolysin proteins of bacteria. So until 2010, people used to believe they are just cell-killing machinery. They will simply rupture erythrocytes, or if they find epithelial cells, they will uh, damage membrane, cells will be dead. But in this, in last 10, 15 years, more uh, results are coming out that immune system can definitely respond to this kind of attack. In fact, uh, we have published one paper in 2015, and now we are continuing that work. We found that the, the I talked about monomer converting into oligomeric pore. Now, these oligomers, once they are generated, they're extremely stable entities. They cannot be digested by proteases. They are SDS resistant. You need, in SDS page, unless we bring the temperature beyond 60 degree, oligomer remains as oligomer. So they're extremely stable. So our hypothesis was that, okay, uh, cell gets killed, membrane gets ruptured, 
but those residual membranes will still be harboring those oligomeric pores. And those oligomeric pores, they cannot just come out from those disintegrated membrane, and they cannot form another pore on the intact cell. But these oligomeric pores, or oligomers, now I'll not call them as pore anymore, these residual oligomers, can they be further recognized by the immune cells, particularly in the infective niche? In fact, we found yes. And not only that, particularly in the context of macrophages and monocytes from PBMCs, uh, in a TLR26 dependent manner, it could actually trigger and activate NF-kappa-B pathway. And our ongoing research that's going on, of course, we are, we'll be communicating very soon, we found that both monomeric and oligomeric form of VCC can also activate dendritic cells. Great, thank you. So now session is open for the questions. <coughs> yeah, please. Uh, macrophage polarization, we have not started looking at yet. But some uh, initial result, very preliminary result for last six months or so suggest that it is still taking it more toward M1, M1 phase, not M2, we have not seen. But uh, ju just to add, there's another PFT which we are working on that is thermostable direct hemolysin from Vibrio parahemolyticus. With that we found over time period, initially it triggers M1 uh, pathway, but toward like after 24 hours, to 26 hour point onward, it somehow skews it more toward M2 phase. Uh, have you studied any interleukins uh, from this? Uh, what types of pro, uh, pro, pro inflammatory markers? Yes. In, at least in the case of both macrophages and dendritic cells, we found, of course, it releases interleukin 6. IL 6, we found TNF alpha is definitely yes. Also, we found IL 1 beta production as well. And TGF beta? TGF beta, we have not checked. Okay. And the last one is that have you checked the ROS production? Because yes. you have checked that the map. In fact, yes, yes. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, of course, it triggers profound ROS generation. Definitely, yes. Thank you very much. How many hours a day you work, Dr. Chalakar? <laughs> It's amazing data and uh, big team you have. No, all the credit goes to the enthusiastic lab members. I, I see Dr. Tarna, she works several hours, you must be working more. <laughs> okay, my only comment is that uh, do you see diagnostic applications of these PFTs and do you find them like fingerprinting for all different kinds of microbes? Uh, to answer your first question, uh, in the PFT field, there is always people talking about these possibilities that if somehow we can impart receptor specificity for cancerous cells or something, then if somehow we can target them or some those who are actually interested, whether they can be, but the main problem is these PFTs, they are so non-specific killer, they can kill anything. They just need lipid bilayer. So how to impart, and that's why, of course, uh, I mean, uh, I don't have much expertise, experience in the therapeutics, but that's why we try to understand all these regulations. Like, what are the residues? What are the domains? So somehow, uh, if not in my tenure, if somebody can impart some regulatory domain so that some specificity can be exerted. I think, I think you took it to therapeutics. My question was for diagnostics. Diagnostics, yeah. Uh, Diagnostics in terms of, you were talking about cholera process? Yes. Okay. Uh, diagnostically, people still don't use it. Of course, hemolysin production, that is, of course, it's a classical marker for Vibrio cholera strains. And I'll just take maybe 30 seconds or so. The, the, particularly VCC. Now, VCC gene is one of the most conserved gene in Vibrio cholera. But if you, uh, if you probably know or something, uh, cholera is, of course, associated with us from long time. Even it is there in our literature, uh, love in the time of cholera. Now, 100 years back, when there was classical cholera, like people got infected with cholera, and within 10 hours, they die. Those were strains which were classical cholera strain, classical vibrio cholera. 
in those strains, Vibrio VCC gene used to be there, but there was 11 base pair deletion, which did not allow 